to the FIVB, to the IOC, and recently to the Pan American Sports Organizations. So far, without any success. The unspoken message is clear. Sports leader, don't betray your family, for you shall never be forgiven. Don't blow the whistle. As you will understand, and as this week will show, the noise of democracy has not yet reached every corner of international sport. Nevertheless, I insist that the situation has changed fundamentally over the past years. It is now legitimate to ask for democracy, transparency and freedom of expression, such as we have done since 1997. But even though this change is encouraging, it's also a bit risky, because good governance can end up as a buzzword that will make politicians, sports leaders and conference organizers feel good without any consequence in reality. So to ensure that ideas are put into practice and that our experiences are not wasted, play the game has to redefine its role. We must still serve as a platform for exposure of sports' darkest side, but we must also engage more with those forces who wish to shape a better sport community. In that spirit, we concluded our 2011 conference by asking the conference delegates to back up behind the so-called Cologne Consensus, which called upon the IOC to organize a world conference in the preparation of a global code for governance in sport. The IOC reacted with a letter, politely saying neither yes or no. Today we can safely conclude that the answer was really no. I can say without exaggeration that we have had more luck with other partners. Together with six European universities and the European Journalism Center, we applied for a grant to carry out a so-called preparatory action for the European Commission's sports unit. This grant allowed us to start a project entitled Action for Good Governance in International Sports Organizations, where we set out to create a scientifically based tool to measure sports governance at the global level. We call this tool the Sports Governance Observer, and you will soon be introduced to it. For Play the Game, as well as for many other small institutions and NGOs in international sport, the key to impact and useful results is fruitful partnerships. This conference is, is an example, and I would like to add my personal thanks to the many partners that have already been mentioned as decisive for the content and the financing of Play the Game 2013. If the line of, lineup of speakers and delegates looks impressive, it's only because so many impressive speakers and delegates have made an effort to come here this week, and we are most grateful to you all for that. As token of our gratitude, we'll now leave the responsibility for the rest of the week to you. Because the success of this conference does not rely on a program on paper, because paper, after all, is silence. It is now your turn to drive the funeral silence out of sport. We know you have the expertise and the personal commitment to enrich your fellow conference delegates. And in the spirit of constructive dialogue, we kindly ask you also to lend an ear to what is presented by others. Even your strongest adversary may possess that bit of information that can make your truth more complete. So, let's make a bit of democratic noise. Let's play the game. Thank you. Yes, thank you for this introduction to uh, the next four days, uh, Jens, uh, there was a silence in the room, and uh, I think that was because uh, Jens, he, he maybe hit some of the right things in his speech. And uh, as he was uh, not trying to hide, uh, play the game is not always that popular among all the international sports organizations. Uh, they don't always see uh, us, particularly Jens, of course, as a good company. Uh, but I'm happy to say that this, this doesn't count for the European institutions. In fact, uh, we feel that they, they are aware of many of the issues we are trying to raise, and they also increasingly take the challenges uh, of sport seriously. Uh, and we are now on the brink of uh, uh, the new budget of the Commission to support sport from 2014 to 2020, and the new uh, work program is coming up, and this is uh, very important, important, and this process, obviously, the input from the European Parliament is of huge uh, importance. 
And that's also why we are so uh, honored to have today the, the vice chairman of the culture, uh, the Committee of on Culture and Education uh, of the European Parliament, uh, Morten Lykkegaard, with, with us here today. He's one of the politicians that has uh, taken the need for a cross-border approach to the challenge of match fixing, very serious in recent years. So Morten, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, Alderman, ladies and gentlemen. Approximately uh, two years ago, I was introduced to the term match fixing for the first time. Um, not surprisingly, it was Jens Seyer uh, who paid me a visit in the European Parliament. Uh, and I was deeply shocked by the facts I received from him. Being an old investigative journalist myself, I have had a chance to follow some of my colleagues disclosing the doping scandals in cycling from the very start some 10 years ago, very often under extremely bad working conditions and harassed by the established cycling stars. I already then lost my illusions and gave up watching Tour de France. But now it seems that sport itself uh, was and is threatened by corruption and international cross-border crime. The cross-border perspective was, of course, why the European Parliament was involved and why Jens Seyer uh, paid me a visit. But I have to be honest with you. Uh, it was and still is very early days politically. Why? Now, if you have a look at the, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, I don't know how many of you maybe actually did that. Uh, the closest you get to, to, to these days to a European constitution, by the way, you'll notice that sport for the first time has its own article, the famous number 165. This article was kind of smuggled into the Lisbon Treaty. At least that's the impression you get uh, when you look at the reactions from the member states when we, the Parliament, during this term, have tried to put some flesh on the bone, many European leaders seem to be worried about the potential consequences of this Article 165. Typically, also in this country, I might add, you will hear the same old song. This is a matter of subsidiarity, often followed by don't mix politics and sports. In short, I think this is the main political challenge today. Having said that, some good things have happened. We, will, we were introduced to this by, the, uh, by, 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 by one of the, sp the, the former speakers. Uh, sport and match fiction was on the agenda at the summit last December uh, in the Council. 26 member states could agree on, and I quote, a strategy to combat manipulation of sport results. But Member state number 27 could not. This day was Malta, as far as I know, the number one center of online gambling in Europe. So without unity, no strategy. But some vague presidency draft conclusions talking about, and I quote again, inviting member states to support initiatives at national level. And the text recommended, and again I quote, close cooperation and information sharing between the member states, the commission, and the sports world. On the other hand, the text continues, and I quote again, this is clearly an area where EU action could bring real added value. And then, lastly, a reference to, and I quote again, the EU work plan for sport for 2011 to 14, which already highlight the fight against mass fishing as a priority topic. So you see, you have this, we this anxiety to, to do something, and on the other hand, you have a system which actually is very difficult to unite on this. So, at least we got a text, and we got a work plan issued by the Commission, and within this plan, we also have a handful of projects uh, which has been launched. You uh, heard about one of them, the Sport Governance Observer Front for once. Looking at the Parliament, there's a broad support for Europol and its very successful investigations. The Justice Committee in our House is aware of the political challenge. 
If you look at the sport portfolio, this is of course placed in the cultural committee, why I happen to be the vice chair. This committee is perhaps the weakest within the parliament, sorry to say. Almost no legislation runs through this committee because of the subsidiarity principle applying to sport and, sport and culture. What we can do in this committee is to put match fixing and other issues on the political agenda, and so we have done. Among other things, we have had a hearing about match fixing. Jens Sai was there, among other. I have raised the issue both in Brussels and in Denmark whenever I had the chance. It has been sometimes uphill. And then, of course, we have one other option as the budget authority. We can ourselves come up with ideas for so-called pilot projects and preparatory actions. These will typically run two to three years and then it will be decided whether they will be a part of a permanent program, which means, of course, more funding. And one just has to take a look at the budget for 2014 in order to see that match fixing is on its way to enter the political agenda, also in the European Parliament. I have personally proposed the European Centre for the fight against match fixing. This was not supported by the Commission, which sometimes is asked by the Parliament to give an assessment of the different proposals. Sports organization at a national level did not fancy the idea either. Fortunately, almost the same idea came from the Justice Committee, only with a slight different focus on giving financial support to different actors at a national level in order to establish, and I quote, new integrated mechanisms involving both police investigators, betting companies, sport organizations, clubs, and gambling regulators. This proposal went through and will now be implemented as a part of the 2014 budget. So, where does this lead us and the fight against match fixing? Well, as anything else in Brussels, that depends. Sport is, as I said, a part of the treaty, but, as I already explained, it's always a danger of in danger of being a fatherless child if the parliament does not care about it. You can't rely on the member states to act as one. Especially online gambling is too important for some member states economically. And we neither can we expect common legislation. Perhaps we don't need it. The Commission now has a plan, and that is of course a big step forward. But, and this is an important detail, sport did not get its own program. It's only a sub-program to what we call Erasmus Plus. And the seven-year budget is incredibly small, only 1.8% of the total amount. So, in short, this is not a guarantee for a serious, convincing, common cross-border effort within the next decade. The Commission has shown so far that it will follow the political winds from the Member States. On the other hand, the European Police is doing a great job, as I just told you. No doubt that good results from the Max Fixing Unit will be essential in order to keep up the political momentum. Finally, the, the Parliament, the long-term support has to come from parliamentarians, I think, but the short-term short perspective is bleak. The elections in May next year is foreseen to be the big breakthrough for Eurosceptics all over Europe. If this is the case, budget for culture and home affairs will be the first to suffer. All in all, I think that uh, fi the fight against match fixing is on the right track politically, However, failure is still an option if we do not bring the common efforts to the next level. What is key in this process is, of course, uh, looking ahead, is a continuing coherent effort from you, from the environment, to fill in the gaps, explain us, the politicians, just how serious this problem is. Otherwise, I fear that the organized crime and its global followers in sports will end up destroying sport as the cultural force, and this, of course, must not happen. So I wish you all very good luck. Thank you. Thank you for this promise that uh, failure is still an option in the fight against uh, match fixing. Uh, now we'll come to an area the governance in sport where, where maybe uh, failure has been a fact uh, for 
several years. And uh, we will discuss, as you know, match fixing uh, tonight and tomorrow and the coming days. And it's up to us, of course, to add to this agenda of match fixing and to also uh, discuss the, f the constructive solutions uh, on match fixing. And that's what we will be doing here. And what we, we already started on doing in Cologne two years ago was to try to find some constructive ways of discussing uh, good governance in uh, international sports organizations. And uh, we have come uh, a long way since then. We uh, had this preparatory action called uh, Action for Good Governance in International Sports Organizations, uh, funded by the, um, the European Union. Uh, and um, <coughs> we are now working on so-called tool called the Sports Governance Observer, and the, the aim of this tool is, of course, to try to assist reforms from within in the international sports organizations. But it's also to make outside scrutiny uh, possible. And, of course, it's a tool to measure the development in the governance practices of the international sports federations. And that is also something we will discuss in the coming days. But now we will have uh, one of the researchers from this project, uh, uh, Arno uh, Gerard, who is from the University of Leuven in Belgium, that was one of the partners of the project, and is now also a, a staff member of Play the Game and the Danish Institute for Sports Studies, working on this tool, and he's going to give you an introduction now to what it's all about. So I will leave the floor to Arno. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, my name is Arnaud Gerard. Uh, it's a difficult name, but you did well, Henrik. Thank you. Um, I'm here to tell you about the Sports Governance Observer, um, a benchmarking tool we are currently finalizing. And this tool will allow us to assess a degree of good governance in any global sport governing body. Uh, before I turn to this tool, I would like to tell you something about testing the state of governance in international sport in general. Now, in particularly, particular, I will do this by telling you about a test study I conducted with two colleagues of mine, uh, Jens Alm from Danish Institute for Sports Studies Play the Game and Michael Grohl from the German Sport University in Cologne. What we did was, well, we tested the state of governance in international sport. We reviewed 35 global sport governing bodies into certain aspects of good governance. By telling you about this study, I will show you the relevance and the importance of the Sports Governance Observer, our tool, and I also show you how we go about measuring good governance in these organizations. Now, importantly, uh, the study I conducted with my two colleagues was part of the EDGES project. Now, um, Henrik has already told you a little bit about this. EDGES stands for Action for Good Governance in International Sports Organizations. This project was funded by the European Commission Sport Units, was part of the preparatory action in uh, sport. The uh, project was led by uh, Play the Game Danish Institute for Sport Studies, and it included six European universities and the European Journalism Centre. Just briefly, the objectives, because I think it's important that you know about this project. First of all, we set out to identify guidelines and possible solutions with regard to good governance in international sports. We wanted to qualify and stimulate the public debate, something that Play the Game has been doing for the past uh, decade, I think. And finally, we wanted to analyze the current state of governance in sport. And this is exactly what we did in our study. Now, if you want to learn more about this project, you can access our website, uh, edges.eu. And there you can find, actually, the outcomes of the project. Um, and in these outcomes, um, the test study is also published. So if you're interested, feel free to go to this website. Okay, about the test study. What we did was review 35 global sport governing bodies. Why 35? Well, because the IOC recognizes 35 so-called international sports federations. Uh, this means that we did not review any regional or continental federations, such as UEFA, nor did we review the IOC itself or special task bodies such as WADA or the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Importantly, we did not conduct a full review of good governance in these organizations, but we focused on certain areas that are perceived as problematic in literature. Accountability, stakeholder participation, and certain issues related to executive body members. 
Now, in the end, our study allowed us to answer two very important questions. First of all, what is the current state with regard to good governance in international sports? Is it as bad as, as certain people sometimes say it is? And secondly, is there a need for a sport governance observer for our tool? Before we did our study, we lacked empirical evidence to answer these two questions. Today, I'm not going to discuss the whole study, uh, but I will only focus on certain accountability issues and the lack of term limits for elected officials. Okay, so let's start with accountability, a term which is often used in relationship to good governance, uh, but even more so, um, or uh, well, people don't really realize what exactly that it entails. Um, and accountability for me and for other researchers implies that you have two actors, and I will call them an actor and a forum. The main question is, how can you make sure that the actor is accountable to the forum? To make this a little less abstract, how can you make sure that in parliamentary democracy that parliamentarians are accountable to the people who have elected them? In businesses, that a board of directors is accountable to the shareholders of the company who own the company or in international sports organizations, that the executive committee is accountable to the member federations of the international uh, sport governing body, because they have created the organization, usually, and they own it. First of all, you have to make sure that the actor has to explain and justify its conduct to the forum. Then the forum, in turn, should be in the position to pose questions and pass judgment, and the actor should can face consequences. Only when you have those three elements present, you can talk about an accountability relationship. So A, B, and C. If you lack these kinds of arrangements in your organization, you will see that it constitutes a breeding ground for corruption, uh, concentration of power, the lack of democracy, and importantly also the lack of effectiveness of the organization. Okay, so this is a theory. Let's take a look at the 35 global sport governing bodies we reviewed. If you want to make sure that executive committee members explain and justify their conduct, you need to install certain monitoring mechanisms. For instance, there definitely is a need for uh, complete and credible information about the accuracy of accounting and financial reporting of the governing body, the executive committee. Now, according to well-established corporate governance practice, this can be done by installing a financial and an audit committee. So we took a look at these organizations and we found that in only 11 out of 35, they had a financial committee. In only 12 out of 35, there was an audit committee. So already here you can see certain accountability deficits. Another issue is funding. A lot of global sport governing bodies give funding to the member federations. And this is a good thing because it helps to develop the sports at uh, local levels. However, you must take certain accountability risks into account. First of all, funding can be used to get support for a certain policy agenda. And member federations may become rather benevolent in order to be able to get the funding from their executive committee. In this case, you will see that member federations will not be inclined to pose questions and pass judgment, and they will turn from watchdogs into lab dogs for their executive committee. So how do you solve this? Well, actually, it's very simple. You have to make specific decisions related to the distribution of funding objectively reproducible. How do you do this? Well, by making sure that funding is awarded according to objective pre-established criteria. Secondly, you have to make distributed funding open to outside scrutiny. How do you do this? Very easy. Distribute funds in a transparent manner. So this is not complicated. This is quite simple actually, but this is a theory. Let's take a look at the practice. We found evidence of funding being distributed in 18 out of the 35 organizations we reviewed. This does not imply that in the other 17 organizations funding isn't being distributed, but we simply couldn't find any evidence for this. So we focused on those 18 organizations and we found that in only two organizations, objective criteria are used um, to award funding. In only three organizations, funding was uh, fully transparently being distributed. So in an answer to the question, are funds 
in global sport governing bodies distributed transparently and according to pre-established criteria? The answer must be in general, no, they're not. Next issue, an ethics committee. This is actually an excellent tool for holding executive committee members accountable. Okay. However, we must make sure that the three elements of, of an accountability relationship are present. Three elements I discussed earlier. Um, the executive committee should be able to explain and justify its conduct to the ethics committee. The ethics committee should be able to pose questions, pass the judgment, and the executive committee members may face consequences. Therefore, the ethics committee should have the power to initiate proceedings on its own initiative, so without referral by um, the executive committee members or the president. Otherwise, they will never investigate, of course. Secondly, ethics committee should be sufficiently independent from the executive committee, meaning simply that there shouldn't be any executive committee members in the ethics committee. Again, this is simple. This is sounds logical. But this is the theory, so let's take a look at the practice. Everything, of course, starts with a code of ethics. And in the organizations we reviewed, we only found a code of ethics in 17 out of 35. An ethics committee, we found in 12 out of 35. So again, we took a closer look at those 12 ethics committees, and we established that in only three cases, the ethics committee was sufficiently independent from the executive committee. In only one case, the uh, Ethics Committee was able to conduct investigations on its own initiative without referral by the Executive Committee or the President. So in an answer to the question, are Ethics Committees present, are they sufficiently independent, and can they initiate proceedings on their own initiative? Again, the answer is, in general, no, they are not. So this was the final accountability issue I wanted to discuss today. And the final issue I'm going to discuss today was uh, is term limits for elected officials. Limiting the terms of elected officials actually um, constitutes a remedy for several tenure issues. First of all, high rates of re-election stemming directly from the advantage that somebody who is already in a position enjoys over a challenger. Secondly, apathetic voters due to the certain re-election of incumbents if you are sure that a certain guy, or woman, but usually a guy, is going to be re-elected re no matter what, you will lose interest. Finally, monopolization of power. If you can stay in office forever in your international sports organization, logically, you can monopolize a lot of power. So again, this was a theory. Let's take a look at the practice. We found term limits to be present in only six out of the 35 organizations we reviewed. And I would like to finish this by showing you an example of the potential monopolization of power due to the lack of term limits, by showing you the average number of years in office for the 35 sport governing bodies uh, presidents we reviewed. So on your left side, you see um, 35 organizations we reviewed at the bottom you see the average number of years in office ranging from 0 to 40, actually. So let's have a little race, a little competition here. And it appears that we have a winner. It is the International uh, Luch Federation, because its former president was in office for 37 years. World Taekwondo Federation is a good second with 29 years. And the bronze medal goes to International Skiing Federation with 25 years in office. These are, of course, three outliers, but actually 19 organizations have an average above 10 years, some 22 have an aver average above 8 years, and for three organizations at the top, we couldn't find any information. So this doesn't tell you everything, of course, we're only working with averages, but I believe it tells you something. So to conclude, in our study, we found empirical evidence for the lack of good governance in global sport governing bodies. And we established that the ethical scandals, um, some of which are going to be discussed during um, this conference and have already been discussed by uh, Jens here, are actually, for a large part, institutionally induced. This means that the lack of certain organizational arrangements actually constitutes a breeding ground for corruption, concentration of power, 
the lack of democracy, and also the lack of effectiveness of these organizations. So there is a problem. How can, can we change this situation? We do not believe that it is likely that change can come from within these organizations. Why not? Well, because there is a lack of accountability mechanisms, and therefore those that govern the organizations are not inclined to reflect on their own behavior, while at the same time, bad behavior doesn't have a consequence. Eh? often goes unpunished. So there is definitely a need for some form of external pressure. At the same time, we must realize that quite often those that govern international uh, sport governing bodies don't realize what constitutes good governance. And they should be helped, they should be informed. So what we learned from this was there is a need for a comprehensive list of good governance indicators firmly grounded in theory. There also is a need for some external pressure, which can, for instance, be done by benchmarking, naming, shaming. And therefore, in our minds, our tool, our sports governance observer, provides an excellent step towards answers to these needs. Now, to finish this presentation, I would like to briefly discuss our sports governance observer. What is the Sports Governance Observer? Well, basically, it's a list of 47 indicators of good governance divided into four dimensions. Transparency, public communication, democratic process, checks and balances, and solidarity. Now, each of these indicators, for each of these indicators, we devised uh, a scoring system. Eh? So we assign a score to each indicator, ranging from one for not, not fulfilled at all, over two, weak, three, moderate, four, good, to five, state of the art. Now this allows us to um, give a score to each indicator, to give a score to each dimension, but also to give an overall score for each organization we review. So in the end, we can make a ranking of organizations we review, and this is, of course, um, interesting uh, for journalists. If you want to learn more about this EDGES project and the Sports Governance Observer, I kindly invite you to join us uh, at our EDGES session tomorrow. Um, the final version of the study I was talking about has been published online uh, at the website of the International Journal of Sports Policy and Politics. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or to talk to me after this uh, presentation. For now, thank you very much for your attention. next days we will have some uh, case stories of what can sometimes happen, what is possible if you have uh, poor governance in international sports organizations. And we will also have workshops where uh, Arno Gerard and uh, some of the other partners from this project and other uh, experts on good governance. And of course also FIFA will be here uh, on Wednesday and uh, to discuss uh, their reform process. So there will be lots of uh, interesting uh, content about good governance uh, in the coming uh, days. And now we move, uh, move back to match fixing and to, uh, to football, because uh, we found, uh, and they sure need it in the, also here in Aarhus, uh, they could need it in the local <laughs> football club, we found a, a perfect uh, target player uh, because uh, Mario Sismek was, uh, as a footballer, uh, without a salary uh, in his Croatian club for many months. He was a perfect target player, uh, not uh, as a striker, because he was uh, not playing as, as a striker most of the time, but he was a perfect target player for match fixers. And uh, he's going to give us now his story, supported by the International Players Union, FIFPRO, of uh, how it came to this, and uh, that gives us kind of sense of what we will be talking about also in the match fixing se sessions uh, later today and tomorrow. Obviously, it is not easy for uh, Mario Sismek to come here and speak in front of this uh, big crowd. He has had a, a long, glorious career, not a glorious maybe, but a good uh, career as a pro professional uh, football player in for 20 years and uh, it was destroyed in just uh, one month. So uh, Mario Sismek, please take the floor 
and it will be uh, possible uh, to ask questions to Mario after his presentation. My name is Mario Cizmek, uh, born 23 December uh, 1975 in Zagreb. My career began in Zagreb when I signed my first professional contract. Besides, then I have played approximately 250 games for the Croatian First League. I have also played for national team for uh, uh, team uh, under 21. Until the moment of this case that is called offside, I played in professional in a responsible manner. I was completely harnessed to sports and anything achieved was down uh, to hard work and my love for sport. Alternately, I life sometimes things happen but uh, happen that we don't want to happen and that we never imagine in our worst nightmares. Night, uh, nightmares. But it's happened I, and I'm a witness for that. I agree to speak about my experience with corruption in football because I want to warn all sportsmen against falling into the trap of match fixing. Uh, they should listen to me so they can recognize negative uh, circumstances and uh, can intervene and in that uh, sense avoid unhappens. During the season 2009-2010, I played for NK Sesvete that fought for survival in first football uh, league. The situation in club was exceptionally bad. There was a financial crisis, but, uh, bad conditions for training and people on the board. They did not care for, uh, uh, for players. <coughs> I and another players had not been paid a regular salary for 14 months and over money on taxes and my pension. Uh, we had no money and we no longer spoke about training or the football, but only about how we were going to survive. Every other day we would, we would ask uh, whether we would uh, we will pay and then we'll say yes on Monday. Then we'll say okay on Monday, but that would not pay on Monday only a promise to be paid in Wednesday. And then no money, and, that, uh, and, uh, and then no money uh, that day either. It went, uh, in, uh, it went on four months, and the whole team uh, sank into depression. The only way out uh, was to move to another club. But the problem was that our club uh, uh, demanded and compensation that was way too, too high. We lodged a claim with the Croatian Football Federation uh, arbitrary court to terminate our contracts and, then g uh, and, uh, and get our dues paid. But this process take a long time so we are forced to play for the club for at least six months uh, and maybe a whole year. I came to training as the rest of the team without any, any will. Positive sports energy and from day, day to day we are sink, uh, sinking deeper and deeper in our spirits. We did, not, uh <coughs> we did not have anybody to turn to because we were unprotect, uh, unprotected and left to our own uh, device. This was the situation that was the, the best for the criminal. They could create their own success on the uh, backs of others. Uh, these depressive days on one person show, uh, showed up and it was a person that was known to all us from the football society. It was a person that was a member of Zagreb Football Association and he promised us a way of, uh, out of the crisis and he said uh, it was a cooperation with other clubs and the board of our club. He wanted us to fix the results of some of the games during the rest of the season. It was about six games uh, that we are not important for the future. Uh, 
uh, is not important for the future of uh, our club because we are already s certain to fall out of the first uh, league. And that is how it all begin. One game after the others, there is con uh, constant, uh, constant pressure. We felt our, uh, we felt our soul were uh, uh, being eaten, and we were uh, deeply ashamed. The feel, the feeling was terrible, but I could not go back. The organizer was pres pres uh, present everywhere in our lives, and he put pressure on us. Each game, he would call us and uh, and uh, and tell us how and what we had to do to fulfill his ex expectation. And I sold my pride for small money compared to the loss uh, that I feel and that I am living with today. The agony <coughs> latest until, until the end of the championship of 8, 8 June 2010. I was arrested in my home <coughs> in front of uh, my daughters and the situation was terrible. Until yesterday, I was in their eyes a father and football player and in only few minutes, I became their shame. Uh, I was in jail 47 days and I felt as is I was dreaming, but often uh, it was my reality. When I came out of the jail, the case went, uh, went to the court and it's followed by the media and, uh, <coughs> and was uh, an even heavier weight on me. I was sentenced to 10 months in prison and the authorities want me to pay back uh, some money. And worst of all, I can never play football again in Croatia because I have a lifelong ban from the Croatian Nas Nas National Association. Today I'm asking myself, was my career worth so, uh, so much that I could gamble for the money that, what, that was not even close to what, what I have been playing for, but for but had not uh, pain, uh, uh, been paid. Of course, I'm not running away from my responsibility and I re real, uh, realized my, uh, the, the, the mistake. <coughs> I made uh, and I will responsibility for I have done, but nobody can give me back to to me what I had before the offset affair, and that is the sport spirit of doing your best and taking pride in, pride in, in it. Uh, import, important for the clean game is the main precondition for success or all field, fields of life, and also in sports because only bad step can run everything that we have uh, given our lives for through training and sacrifice. Everything is worth it. Today, everybody, everybody is aware the, that there is more and more crime in professional sport, especially in football, because we are talking about big money and sports is a good platform for those that want to come to money in an illeg illegal way. Sportsmen <coughs> must recognize this situation in the time and they must be able to inform leaders and the other responsible people uh, that work together with agencies to help prevent them falling into a trap like me. Thank you to Mario for giving us his uh, personal story. Uh, as you can hear, uh, it's not easy for him to tell the story, and uh, he we have uh, uh, now an interpreter, uh, Elvia Kikic, who will uh, assist Mario in answering the questions you might have. So I don't know if you we have uh, questions from the floor. Uh, you can ask about everything. Uh, Mario might not want to uh, <laughs> give an answer to all the questions because there's uh, still a court case going, but feel free to ask. And when you ask, please uh, state who you are and also who you uh, represent if you re represent uh, somebody. So I 
give the first question here. Yes, uh, thank you for your story. Very interesting and a very important story. Uh, I have a P question. Please say who you are. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Hannah Brevik. I'm uh, uh, working in the sports department in NRK, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, you said you were approached by a person who was an official. Um, was this a high-ranked official uh, person who came to you with this uh, illegal uh, proposition? It was not uh, an high-ranking official. It was more on a local area sphere from the Zagreb area. A football person, a football official. National team and not the local. Team. It was uh, a football official, but not from the national association. It was from the local regional area, Zagreb. from region of Zagreb. What did he know about this person? He knew everything about him. Because he did uh, coach uh, the trainer in my beloved Malena. This person was a big uh, football coach, and it was a person that was known for them uh, for a long time since they were small children. So they knew and you knew and trusted this person in, yeah. in a way uh, who uh, uh, made you fix the games? Uh, they knew uh, him and uh, that was the reason how he could uh, reach to all of them as such. We have one here. Bastian from Basketball Australia. Listening to your story, Mario, it calls to my mind, have there been changes now that if somebody else experienced an approach like this, that they would have somewhere to turn to to report this? Yeah, uh, b uh, before when this uh, uh, this happened in Croatia, we don't, uh, like you heard, we don't have nobody to help us. Now uh, we have FIF Pro, this is organization which syndicate for the players. This time we don't have nobody to 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 say problems or something like this. Just go to arbitration, uh, but it's long period. Uh, uh, nobody don't go to arbitration if don't take a, a salary two months, three months. We go four months. When we come there, we are enemy of the, your club, enemy number one. And then after this, they don't give you to play. Uh, you put them on national this uh, court. It's long period it don't because of this. We don't go. Uh, we don't go uh, enfolded in in this uh, trap. We have a question over here. Yeah. Okay. So then we have one here. Oh, sorry. Sorry for my English, but <laughs> I. I Hi Mario, I'm Jens Lidgren of Swedish uh, daily newspaper Dagens Nyheter, Stockholm. Uh, thank you for coming here. I, I think you show a lot of courage uh, coming here. I want to ask you um, the first game when, when uh, th where you participated to to throw the game. Um, how how did you feel about that? And did you think that it was just going to be one game? Uh, and you did it. osjećaj je bio to vam ja sad jako teško mogu ovaj objasniti svojim riječima It is very hard to explain with words how the feeling was zato što nikad u životu nisi došao na teren da izgubiš nisam volio na treningu izgubiti a kamoli na 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 utakmici I took never to the field to lose a game never in, in my life before Al te nekakvi razlozi ti u životu imaš djecu, obitelj, te navedu na tako i jednostavno kad to jednom napraviš, postoje gotovo. But some circumstances in life, family, children, and all, all the rest of the circumstances, 
are bringing a person to that, and then you make that once, and that's it. So maybe can you can you uh, uh, can you tell us what happened in that first fix you were involved in? How, how what was the order? What were you expected to do, and how did you do it? To je trajalo, taj presing je trajao mjesecima, nismo mi sad uh, da je on došao nama u petak i da bi mi to napravili u, u nedjelju. No, this pressing, this pressure lasted for months. It didn't happen just one day and then we should wait until Sunday and then do it. Uh, in my club it's the uh, in first 11, eight players. In this club uh, there were eight players and they were all in the same situation. And if he wanted he could actually do it against all 16 players in the whole club. So you were you you you. What did you do actually? Did you lose uh, ten nil? Or did you? Uh, no, we uh, uh, and how did you how did you manage to <laughs> to lose in a convincing way? No, uh, we lost uh, two to one. And was that according to to the plan? Uh, what did you did you let the opposition score on purpose, or how did you pretend that uh, it was not on purpose? Uh, no, not not at all like that. If there were eight players that agreed about this, they just didn't give 100% of what they had inside of themselves. <laughs> Even uh, the journalists, if they wanted to play the against us, uh, they could have won against us. <laughs> uh, Mario, uh, here. I'm Daniel Chang from Paraguay. Uh, I didn't get right if, if if you said it in the in the exposition. Were these last uh, six seven games uh, meaningless games for the club? I mean, you weren't uh, fighting for the championship or fighting for the relegation. And since it was a group decision, eight players from the team. How about the others that didn't agree with this? Did they know about this? Were you like? Uh, did you? keep in secret uh, or where some kind of discussion about this? The rest of the team was uh, very young. There they were very young players. Uh, we did not involve these players so much in it. Uh, they were already, uh, the club was already uh, getting out of the league. So it was already decided before that. So it didn't. So they managed to be relegated without fixing the games. And then <laughs> afterwards <laughs> they started. <laughs> uh, we have uh, one here. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. Um, that's right. That's right. Thank you for your compelling tale, Mario. Um, Please Sina tell Hen us who you are. Excuse me? Please uh, yeah, say I your name. Yeah, I was about to yeah. do that. <laughs> Sina Hansen from Danish School of Media and Journalism. I was kind of wondering whether you felt uh, threatened by the, the man who confronted you and asked you to fit fix the match. Mm -hmm. was, yes. it, was it only um, something that you could do if you wanted the money, or did you feel that it would have consequences to say no? I didn't feel that as uh, I didn't see that as some kind of threat as such. Not in the beginning. Poslije nas je stalo nas je onako ajde sad ćete ovako sad ćete onako ne, sad da poslije mi više to bilo nije mi to bilo kao pretnja koliko mi je bilo onako osjećao sam se jadno što to radim a, a, 
uh, of the Greenland Forum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Later on, it was uh, as some kind of pressure. He said to us, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. And we felt pity as such. We felt sad because of what happened and, and, and why we, and why why we did that. And I couldn't sleep anymore after that. Erik Meinig is mid Aarhus University and the local football club in need of a striker. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I would like to ask you, so there were a group of eight among you that were part of this game. Did you persuade the others or did this official approach you all or how does things like this work in practice? <laughs> Sam, on je sve, sve te ljude poznao i znači on je prilazio. As I said before, uh, this man knew all of these players. So he approached all of these players individually. Thank you for coming today. Pam Boltler from Women Can International in, in the United States. At what point can your story that represents so many players around the world be presented as a human rights issue rather than just a corruption issue. Da, ovaj uh, ovaj recimo uh, match fixing uh, <laughs> znači namještanje utakmica u Hrvatskoj u tom dijelu Europe je je zbog toga što se tako odnose prema igračima. Yeah, in this case of ma match fixing in in Croatia and in, in this region as such the main reason why it happens it is because of the the behavior they have uh, against the players and this is a very good question uh, when it comes to that uh, because these rights as rights we didn't have them at that time it's mu it's a bit better now when these laws have been come Ja ne znam šta je navelo ove tamo u Italiji igrači ovo baš u ovom dijelu Europe ja znam da je to samo zbog toga što nisu plaćeni igrači. I don't know what uh, what brought these players in Italy for example to to do these things but I know that in this region the main reason was that uh, the players were not paid. I, I can add that uh, this evening we have uh, speaker uh, talking about the, con the, the conditions that professional players uh, are live under in many uh, countries in Europe. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Hello, I'm Mr. Chris Rasmussen from uh, the World Lottery. Um, do you have any idea where the money has been placed from the guy who wanted you to fix the match? Um, is that in the local country or is that the uh, Asia market or yeah? Da, da li ima veću stavljanje para, da li je to u lokalnim uh, tržištima ili u Aziji ili na određenim tržištima? <laughs> ja znam kad je to počelo, uh, kad je to počelo, ja to nisam znao. When this began, I know that I didn't know about that. Sad kad je bilo suđenje, de, sad ja znam da je to bilo u Aziji ili ne znam kako. After the judicial process, now I know that it, wa it happened in Asia. Do you know how much money was won on the matches? Have you heard about that uh, during the process? I don't know about that. Uh, Klaus Elon from Extrabird here in Denmark. Um, at the time of the fix, did you know about the eight others or have you only learned about the eight others uh, during the process? U Hrvatskoj znači su bila tri kluba i znao sam sve te igrače, njih nas 24 nas je bilo osuđeno. And during this process there was uh, there was three clubs involved and all 24 players we knew all each other in between us. Uh Leviathan Hendricks from the Federation of Gay Games um based in London. I am anyway. Um, thank you very much for being here and sharing your story, especially in a language you're not as familiar with. I thought that was fantastic. Well done. Um, 
you've played in different countries around the world, it says here, Israel and Iceland. Were you aware in your, in your travels and being part of different leagues around the world of similar circumstances that may have, could potentially lead uh, to match fixing in, in other countries? Yeah, I think we see Groenlandia, right? Which we yeah. mentioned we didn't really leave. Uh, yeah. Iceland, we died to pretty many teams, but in the future, we might have uh, a future where we match fixing and even pack. Ne, zato što u to vrijeme ja sam bio normalno plaćen i ni na kraj pameti nije bilo. No, in that time in that time I was a completely uh, normal player with normal pay. So I didn't do so much of that. Hello, Karen Jones, uh, Astor International Sports Law Center um, out of the Netherlands. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the financial strains and the pressures of the players. Uh, we talk about uh, governance in sports now and a lot of times we talk about the need for um, whistleblower protections and um, anonymous uh, call-in lines and things like that. Um, at the time that you were going through this, would you have used something like that? And do you feel that conditions have changed enough now that that would be a benefit. Da, prošli su još od početka 90-a na savi, ja sam čak bio korespondent uh, na Kotara i ja mislim da puno priča ima oko tog upravljanja, znači oko organizacije. Yeah. Da je bila mogućnost pisanja javne, znači da onda neko izađe i anonimno da prijavi neke slučajeve, da je bila ta mogućnost, da li bi ti koristio tu mogućnost da prijaviš cijeli taj slučaj, da to se tebi reći. Pa, da normalno da bi, kad vidim kroz to što sam sve prošao. Of course, uh, right now I would, I would have done it after I have been through all of this. Zato i upozoravam ovaj igrač kad idem tamo da, da mu pokažem, da vide na moje priče, da moraju upozoriti. And that is why I am uh, doing this to, to explain and warn to uh, the young players uh, how it is and how it can be. But I think the question was, uh, does he think that for example in Croatia some rules or some helplines or what uh, have been put in place that would prevent this from happening? Uh, today, what happened to him? Tu što ona pita, kaže je da, da imaju neke linije s pomoć koji se to može preventirati, da se to ne desi ponovno u Hrvatskoj. Da li je nešto etablirano s pomoć Pa tako, znači pomoć PIF Pro-a. Pomoć PIF Pro-a uh, uh, je puno bolje, bar ti, uh, to još uvijek nije, nije kako bi trebalo biti. Right now, it's, it's better with PIF Pro uh, than before, but it's not uh, as it should be. We have three more questions there and there and there. Uh, yes? Yes, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Yara Inani from the Danish School of Media and Journalism. Uh, my question is, did you think about uh, exposing the problem to the Croatian Football Federation or the International Football Association? Da, da li sam razmišljala da to prijavim, znači cijeli taj slučaj Hrvatskom nogometnom savezu i međunarodnim nekim institucijama i drugim? Pa sad, uh, sad nisam uh, razmišljala o tome, jer to napravljam. In that time, uh, I did not think about that. Otherwise, I, I would not have done it. As I said before, uh, we all we were only thinking about how to survive. We didn't have anything, so we didn't think so much. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> it was what no, it was not worth anything. If it would, uh, the best thing would have been that I uh, took my uh, soccer football shoes and I throw them out and, and just went out and worked with something else. I'm Katarina Jozna from Dennis School of Media and Journalism as well, and I just wanted to ask, you mentioned that you are taking the responsibility for what you did, so my question is, uh, what kind of punishment uh, do you think you deserve? <laughs> he will go for a swim during the storm, okay. yes. <laughs> Pa ne, ja, ja, ja nisam došao ovdje da mene neko žali. Ja ovo sve zaslužujem što sam dobio. Možda ne sad da odem u zatvor, uh, uh, baš u zatvor, ali, ali zaslužujem sve što mi se desilo. To, moja, to sam ja, sam sam si kriv za to. I didn't came here, so people should feel pity of me. Uh, I'm completely aware of what I have done, and, uh, and 
I'm aware of the situation. 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 But there is one thing I, I feel uh, a bit angry about, that it is that no player in Europe at all ever uh, ended in, in jail. A u svakoj zemlji u Evropi uh, imamo mečkicu, imamo znači namještanje utakmice. And possibly in all the countries in Europe there there is some kind of match fixing going on. Hi Mario, uh, my name is Ezequiel Fernandez Murs from Argentina newspaper La Nación. You know there was a writer, he was a Nobel Prize winner. His name is Albert Camus. He played football, he was goalkeeper. And once uh, he was asked about life and football, and he said, after many years during which I saw many things, what I know most surely about morality and the duty of man, I owe to sport and learned in my country. Do you share this opinion? Can you repeat the question? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the phrase, the quote the of quote, yeah. Albert Camus. After many years during which oh. I saw many things, what I know most surely about morality and the duty of man, I owe to sport and learned in my country. Yes, and what to tell you more? <laughs> I think uh, we need coffee uh, <laughs> after this uh, question. <laughs> and uh, we will be, uh, w first of all, of course, I would like to thank Mario for his courage to come here. And I know uh, Mario will be available also uh, for interviews uh, if anybody wants to speak to him uh, after this session. And uh, we will try to have strict time management. So we will start again at 3.30. So thank you for everybody for this session.